chapter 8, section 0, what role did the state take in the creation of capitalism? If the so-called anarcho-capitalist is to claim with any plausibility that real capitalism is non-statist or that it can exist without a state, it must be shown that capitalism evolved naturally in opposition to state intervention. However, in reality, the opposite is the case. Capitalism was born from state intervention, and in the words of Kropotkin, the state and capitalism developed side by side, mutually supporting and reinforcing each other. Numerous writers have made this point. For example, in Carl, uh, Carl Polyani's flawed masterpiece, The Great Transformation, we read that the road to the free market was opened and kept open by an enormous increase in continuous, centrally organized, and controlled interventionism by the state. This intervention took many forms. For example, state support during mercantilism, which allowed the manufacturers, i.e. industry, to survive and develop, enclosures of common land, and so forth. In, order, in addition, the slave trade, the invasion and brutal conquest of the Americas and other primitive nations, <clears throat> the, uh, and the looting of gold, slaves, and raw materials from abroad also enriched the European economy, giving the development of capitalism an added boost. Thus, Kropotkin, quote, the history of the genesis of capital has always been, by socialist, uh, to been told by socialists many times. They've described how it was born of war and of pillage, of slavery and of serfdom, of modern fraud and exploitation. They have shown how it n was nourished by the blood of the worker and how little by little it conquered the whole world. Or, or, if Kropotkin seems too committed to be fair, we could listen to John Stuart Mills's statement on it. The social arrangements of modern Europe uh, commenced from a distribution of property, which was the result not of just partition or acquisition by industry, but of con uh, conquest and violence. Principles of Political Economy, page 15. Therefore, when supporters of libertarian capitalism say that they're against the initiation of force, they mean only new initiations of force. For the system they support was born from numerous initiations of force in the past, and as can be seen from the history of the last hundred years, it also requires state intervention to keep it going. Indeed, many thinkers have argued that it was precisely this state support and coercion, per particularly the separation of people from the land, that played the key role in allowing capitalism to develop rather than the theory that previous savings did so. As noted by the German thinker Franz Oppenheimer, argued the, quote, concept of a primitive accumulation or an original store of wealth in land and in movable property brought about by means of purely economic forces, while seemingly quite plausible, is in fact utterly mistaken, and it is a fairy tale, or it is a class theory used to justify the privileges of the upper classes. The State, pages 5 and 6. This thesis will be discussed in the following sections. It is, of course, ironic to hear right-wing libertarians sing the praises of a capitalism that never existed and urge its adoption by all nations, in spite of the historical evidence suggesting that only state intervention made capitalist economies viable, even in that mecca of free enterprise as in the United States, as Noam Chomsky even argues, who but a lunatic could have opposed the development of a textile industry in New England in the early 19th century, when British textile production was so much more efficient that half the New England industrial sector would have gone bankrupt without very high protective tariffs, thus terminating industrial development in the United States? Or the high tariffs that radically undermined economic efficiency to allow the United States to develop steel and other manufacturing capacities. Or the gr gross distortions of the market that created modern electronics. World Orders, Old and New, page 168. To claim, therefore, that mercantilism is not capitalism makes little sense. Without mercantilism, proper capitalism would, would have never developed. And any attempt to divorce a social system from its roots is ahistoric and makes a mockery of critical thought. Similarly, it is somewhat ironic when so-called anarcho-capitalists and right libertarians claim that they support the freedom of individuals to choose how to live. After all, the working class was not given that particular choice when capitalism was developing. Indeed, their right to choose their own way of life was constantly violated and denied. So to claim that now, after capitalism has been created, that we get the chance to try and live as we like is, well, 
insulting to the extreme. The available options we have are not independent of the society we live in and are decisively shaped by the past. To claim we are free to live as we like within the laws of capitalism is basically to argue that we're able to buy the freedom that every individual is due from those who have stolen it from us in the first place. Needless to say, some right libertarians recognize that the state played a massive role in encouraging industrialization, more correct to say proletarianization, but as it created a working class which did not own the tools they used, although stress that this process started on the land and not in industry. So they contrast bad business people who took state aid and good ones. Thus, Rothbard's comment on the Marxists have made no particular distinction between bourgeoisie who made use of the state and the bourgeoisie who acted on the free market, Ethics of Liberty, page 72. But such an argument is nonsense as it ignores the fact that the free market is a network and defined by the state by the property rights it enforces. For example, the owners of the American Steel and other companies who grew rich and their companies uh, big behind protectionist walls are obviously bad bourgeoisie. But are the bourgeoisie who supplied the steel companies with coal, machinery, food, defense, and so on not also benefiting from state action? And the suppliers of the luxury goods to the wealthy steel company owners, did they not benefit from state action? Or the suppliers of commodities to the workers that labored in the steel factories that the tariffs made possible, did they not benefit? And the suppliers to these suppliers and the suppliers to those suppliers, did not the users of technology first introduced into industry by companies protected by state orders also not benefit? Did not the capitalists who had large and landless working class to select from benefit for, uh, select from benefit from the land monopoly, even though they may not have, unlike other capitalists, directly advocated it? It increased the pool of wage labor for all capitalists and increased their bargaining position and power in the labor market at the expense of the working class. In other words, such a policy helped maintain capitalist market power, irrespective of whether individual capitalists encouraged politicians to vote to create and maintain it. And similarly, all capitalists benefited from the changes in common law to recognize and protect capitalist private property and rights that the state enforced during the 19th century. It appears that for Rothbard, the collusion between state and business is the fault not of capitalism, but of particular capitalists. The system is pure. Only individuals are corrupt. But for anarchists... The origins of the modern state capitalist system lies not in the individual qualities of capitalists, but in the dynamic and evolution of capitalism itself, a complex interaction of class interest and class struggle and social defense against the destructive actions of the market, individual qualities, and so forth. In other words, Rothbard's claims are flawed. They fail to understand capitalism as a system and its dynamic nature. Indeed, if we look at the role of the state in creating capitalism, we could be tempted to rename so-called anarcho-capitalism Marxian capitalism. This is because given the historical evidence, a political theory can be developed by which the dictatorship of the bourgeoisie is created and that this capitalist state withers away into anarchy. That this means rejecting the economic and social ideas of Marxism and their replacement by the direct opposite should not mean that we should reject the idea, after all, what is the so-called anarcho-capitalism has done to individualist anarchism. But we doubt that many so-called anarcho-capitalists will accept such a name change, even though this would reflect their part politics far better. After all, they don't object to past initiations of force, just current ones. And many do seem to think that the modern state will wither away due to those market forces. But it's beside the point. The fact remains that state action was required to create and maintain capitalism. Without state support, it's doubtful that capitalism would have developed at all. So when the right suggests that we be left alone, what they mean by we comes into clear focus when we consider how capitalism developed. Artisans and peasants were only left alone to starve, and the working classes of industrial capitalism were only left alone outside work, and for only as long as they respected the rules of their betters. As for the other side of the class divide, 
They desire to be left alone, to exercise their powers over others. As we'll see, that modern capitalism is in fact a kind of corporate mercantilism, with states providing the conditions that allows corporations to flourish. Tax breaks, subsidies, bailouts, anti-labor laws, etc., etc. This says more about the statist roots of capitalism than the ideological correct definition of capitalism used by its supporters. 